Good evening, and welcome <laughs> to to Winsome Peace Theater. Good morning, Lab, Chicken Breast, uh, Chloe, <clears throat> and Bert, and definitely Apple. Tonight's tale is a tale of suspense and terror, as we <laughs> as we wind up for. The Far Harbor Adventure. Please, contain yourself. This might be a frightening yarn of a tale as we, as we explore the themes surrounding the Far Harbor DLC. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hold on. put it. <clears throat> Winsome Whale Shark presents Far Harbor Prologue. <clears throat> <clears throat> oh, it might help if the book is up. It's right set up. During the winter of 1927-28, officials of the federal government made a strange and secret investigation of certain conditions in ancient Massachusetts seaport of Innsmouth. The public first learned of it in February, when a vast series of raids and arrests occurred, followed by the deliberate burning and dynamiting, under suitable precautions, <laughs> of an enormous number of crumbling, worm-eaten, and supposedly empty houses along the abandoned waterfront. Uninquiring souls let this occurrence pass as one of the many clashes in spasmodic war on liquor. Keener news followers, however, wondered at the prodigious number of arrests, the <laughs> abnormally hello Condor, abnormally large force of men used in making them, and the secrecy surrounding the disposal of the prisoners. No trials or even definitive charges were reported, nor were any of the captives seen thereafter in the regular gals of the nation. Innsmouth itself was left almost depopulated and is now only beginning to show signs of a sluggishly revived existence. People around the country and nearby towns muttered a great deal amongst themselves, but said very little to the outside world. And this is the tale of how I, a young and winsome whale shark, one second, win and winsome whale shark, came to find myself in Innsmouth in July of 1927. I was on my coming-of-age tour, intending to travel from Newbury to Arkham to meet my mother's family there. It was then I chanced upon a ticket agent at the station who set, who set me upon a different path in an effort to find me a cheaper fare. I approached this agent, and he said to me, You could take that old bus, I suppose, he said with a certain hesitation. Ah, uh, but it, uh, it ain't much thought of hereabouts. It goes through Innsmouth. You may have heard about it. Run by an Innsmouth fellow, Joe Sargent. Never gets any custom from here or from Arkham either. Wonder it keeps running at all. <laughs> ah, says I, a cheap, cheap bus fare that no one actually uses. Color me intrigued. Well, Innsmouth has many more buildings than people and no commerce to speak of except for uh, fishing and some odd kind of craft jewelry that you got going on. Very bespoke. Uh, of course, there is the old tales of pirate treasure hid in the marshes of Devil Reef, but uh, uh, you wouldn't be interested in, um, in that on account of the devils in Devil's Reef. Uh, the real, or so they say. And then there's the folks living there. Strange sort of people with scabby skin, swished faces, bulging eyes, wrinkly necks, and all losing their hair. Can't much hold a conversation with them since they don't take kindly to strangers. Uh, right, and then there's that whole uh, cult thing. Don't know much about it. Uh, the, uh, the esoteric order of uh, dragon, dragon, something like that. Uh, at this point, I, being quite the adventurous young shark, said to the ticket agent, good sir, please, Cease your prattling and take my fare. <laughs> With ticket in hand and time to spare, I sought out more locals around the station to ask about Innsmouth. Very soon, I found myself in the library, and upon speaking to the librarian, I then gained introduction to a most matronly shark, Anna Tilton. Miss Tilton, bless her, then gave me access to a collection of most curious Innsmouth out artifacts, among which I had eyes only for a particular bauble. A second. 
<clears throat> Where were we? Oh gosh, a couple pages. <clears throat> it took no excessive sensitiveness to beauty to make me literally gasp <gasps> at the earthly splendor of the alien, opulent fantasy that rested there on the purple velvet cushion. <clears throat> Even now I can hardly describe what I saw, though it was clearly some sort of tiara, as the description had said. It was tall in front, with a very large and curiously irregular periphery, as if designed for a head of almost freakishly elliptical outline. <laughs> the material seemed to be predominantly gold, though a weird, lighter lustrousness hinted at some strange alloy with an equally beautiful and scarcely identifiable material. The patterns all hinted of some remote secrets and unimaginable abysses in time and space, and the monotonously aquatic nature of the reliefs became almost sinister. <laughs> Among these reliefs were fabulous monsters of abhorrent grotesqueness and malignity, half a <laughs> half ichthylic and half bat track. Oh my gosh, in suggestion, <laughs> which one could not dissociate from certain haunting and uncomfortable sense of pseudo memory. Miss Tilton speculated that the strange tiara was a remnant of that old pirate treasure, most of which had already been got by the Marsh family, the matron matriarchs of Innsmouth. She then went on to make it clear to me that she didn't think kindly of Innsmouth at all, what with all the devil worshippers. As you do. Needless to say, I had much to think about that night as I went to sleep at the local uh, YMCA. <clears throat> The next morning I found myself waiting for the bus a little before 10, and there it came along, a neglected and janky thing, painted a dreary gray to match the dreary description of its destination. I boarded and took a gander at the driver, Joe Sargent, and immediately felt an instinctual aversion to the man. <clears throat> Where's Joe Sargent? Alright. His age was perhaps 35, but the odd, deep creases to the sides of his neck made him seem older when one did not study his dull, expressionless face, he had a narrow head, bulging, watery blue eyes that seemed never to weak, wink in a flat nose. As he walked toward the bus, I observed his peculiarly shambling gait and saw that his fins were inordinately immense. The more I studied them, the more I wondered how he could swim. A certain greasiness about the fellow increased my dislike. He was evidently given to working or lounging around the fish docks and carried with him... <laughs> and carried with him much of their characteristic smell. <laughs> the passengers had the same worn down, sullen appearances and distinctly fishy mead. I opened a window. We traveled through the crumbling ruins of abandoned towns and overgrown countryside following a worn coastal road. I realized soon that we had come face to face with the rumored Innsmouth. It was a town of wide extent and dense construction, yet one with a portentous Potentious, portentous dearth of visible life from the tangle of chimney pots scarcely a wisp of smoke came and the three tall steeples loomed dark and unpainted against the seaward horizon one of them one of them was crumbling down on the top and in that and another there were only black gaping holes where clock dials should have been the vast huddle of sagging gambrel roofs and peaked gables conveyed with offensive clearness the idea of wormy decay, and we approached along the now descending road. I could see that many roofs had wholly caved in. <clears throat> Better get a movie adaption. <laughs> so far, I had seen no people in the town, but there now came signs of sparse habitation, curtained windows here and there, and occasional battered motor car at the curb. Pavement and sidewalks were increasingly well defined, and though most of the houses were quite old wooden brick structures of the early 19th century, they were obviously kept for habitation. <clears throat> Soon we came upon an overgrown courtyard and a square white building all in shambles. There was little clue what this building was for, save for the fight fading sign out front that read Esoteric, uh, Esoteric Order of Dagon. Huh, says I. Perhaps this could be that cult I've heard so much about. 
As, at the, as I stared at the building, I saw what could only be the pastor, as he was wearing the fanciest of pastor robes. He had the same look about him as all the other locals, and he was wearing a crown, almost identical to the one Miss Tilton had shown me. Yes, this was de most definitely the famous cult. Fancy that. <clears throat> Soon the bus ride came to an end, and I decided to start my information gathering at the greatest of knowledge repositories, a grocery store. I met with a strapping grocery lab who- er, lad. <laughs> strapping grocery lad who did not at all have the look of a local. He told me much the same as the ticket agent and Miss Tilden had told me, but speculated that perhaps the strange appearance of the locals was some kind of horrible, rare disease, and warned me that quite a few places in In Innsmouth were forbidden to outsiders. At least the fishing was good. He mentioned an old, old gentle shark by the name of Zadok, who might have more information for me. We had a pleasant chat and then the grocer provided me with a hand-drawn map of Innsmouth. What a swell fellow. With map in hand, it only felt right that I should walk incautiously about town with no regard for my personal safety. I passed many houses, seemingly abandoned, the windows broken and the exteriors crumbling. The harbor was in equal disrepair. Oddly, there was little sound to be heard. Hold on. Let me just, let me just, uh, let me just. Okay. Oddly, there was little sound to be heard, aside from the lapping of the waves. Oh, crud, crud buckets. <laughs> aside from the lapping of the waves. I passed no on the streets, not even locals, saw no birds, cats, dogs, or any manner of life one would expect in a town. Even more strangely, this observation did not send me running for my life immediately. In fact, I continued my travails until I came across an old man who could only be Zadok, the wizened drunkard the go grocer had mentioned. I determined that I couldn't simply walk up to him and strike up a chat. Oh no, I must ply him with booze. It's only polite. <laughs> After a quick trip to the local bootlegger, I returned to Zadok with bottled whiskey and fin. We walked for a while and I let the old shark swig the whole bottle. Eventually, we came to a part of the harbor where the Devil Reef was in plain view, and Zadok seemed compelled to provide me with some much needed exposition. Ahem. <clears throat> I might need a little sippy sippy first. Hold on. I gotta, t I gotta talk in Zadok's voice. There's where it all began, that cursed place of all wickedness where the deep waters start. Gate of Hell's sheer drop down to the bottom no sound and light can tech. Old Captain Obed done it, him that found out Warren was good for him in this- And the South Sea Islands, everybody was in a bad way them days. Never was nobody like Captain Obed, old limmer Satan, ha <laughs> ha. By this time it was- perfectly clear that Zadok, drunk as he was, seemed to be the trustworthy and knowledgeable sort, so I didn't question a single thing he was saying. Well, Sir Obed, he learnt that there's things like this on Earth as most folks never heard about, and wouldn't believe if they did here. It seems the natives were sacrificing heaps of the young men and maidens to some kind of god things that lived under the sea, and getting all kinds of favors in return. Frogfish monsters, the lots of them. <clears throat> Perhaps the source. Oops. <laughs> Frogfish persons, the lot of them, all scaly and hiding. Perhaps that was the source of the mermaid tales, but well, I can't say for sure. Them things liked human sacrifices. Had them in ages afore, with lost of track of the upper world after a time. What they done to the victims, it ain't for me to say, and I guess Obad weren't none too sharp about asking. Well, sir. <laughs> well, sir. <clears throat> well, sir, it seems by the time Obed knowed them islanders, they was all full of fish blood from them deep water things on account of the natives. When they got old, they began to show it. They was kept hidden until they felt like ta taken to the water and quitting the place. Some was more touched than others, and never did change enough quite to take to the water. But mostly they turned out but just the way them things said. They was born more like the things changed early, but them as nearly humans stayed on the island. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> 
Then's the time Obed, he began a cursing at the folks for being dull sheep, praying to the Christian heaven as didn't help him none. He told him he knowed of folks as prayed to gods that give something you really need, and says of ye, a good bunch of men stand by him. He could maybe get a whole sortin' of powers, or bring plenty of- Shoot. Wake up. Or bring plenty of fish and quite a bit of gold. <clears throat> I continue to listen to Zadok. Yes, fish people. This sounds to be quite a trustworthy tale indeed. <clears throat> Obed and twenty other odd folk used to row to Devil's Reef in the dead of night and chant things so loudly you could hear them all over town when the wind was right. <laughs> Obed wanted them gold things and was willing to pay heavy, and I guess the others were satisfied for a while. Come in 46, the town done some looking and thinking for itself. Too many folks missing, too much wild preaching and meeting of a Sunday, too much talk about the reef. At this point, old Zadig finished off the whole bottle and subsequently became more and more maudlin and distraught. That awful night, I seized them. I was up at the cupola, hordes of them, swarms of them, all over the reef and swimming up the harbor into the, into the reef. God, what happened in the streets of Innsmouth that night? They rattled our door, but Pa wouldn't open. Then he climbed out the kitchen window with his musket to find Maori and the fishmen and see what he could do. Mounds of the dead and dying, shots and screams, shouting in an old square, ah! At this point, at this point, Zadok became so distraught, he ran off screaming away. Look, the fish people, the fish people are coming. I turned behind me and saw nothing. Perhaps giving Zadok an entire bottle of whiskey was not the best of information obtaining strategies. What had that bootlegger put in the whiskey, anyway? My curiosity was now quite satisfied, and I felt I had my fill of Innsmouth, so I moseyed on over to the bus stop. Old Joe's sharp sergeant arrived with his bus at eight, but gave me a bit of bad news. Ah, you see, the bus was in bad shape and wouldn't last the rest of the trip. It needed repairs, and I'd have to spend the night here in Innsmouth. Not ominous at all. Resigned to my fate, I checked into the local hotel and settled in for the night. A quick check of the room showed the usual, usual accommodations, a bed, a chair, a lamp, and a bathroom. But oddly, the bolt lock had been removed from the room door. <laughs> from the room door. Oh, was, uh, intriguing and not at all alarming. I searched the room and found the bolt hidden in the bed linens, linens and only felt it wise to replace it, and so I did. Satisfied that I was now in no danger whatsoever, I then went to bed. Alas, sleep did not come as quickly to me as I'd hoped. I was wide awake, in fact, overcome as I was with the, all the educating that- Whoops. <clears throat> overcome as I was with all the educating that had been done to me the day before. <laughs> I thought back to the mention of sacrifices and thought, well, wouldn't that just be something to be kidnapped in the night? I'm sure the missing door, mo door bolt isn't at all related. As I sit and thought in my bed, good morning, Mr. T. As I th sat and thought in my bed, I listened to the sounds of the night and realized that there sure was a lot of creaking coming from the hallways, like someone was pacing the halls. I listened even harder, and there, a distinct rattling at my door, and a subtle scrape of a key in the door lock. The noises outside my door grew louder, and there seemed to be more than one assailant trying to gain entry to my room. Things certainly had become quite fishy here, and now I had to escape. I heard the sounds of pursuit from the hall, so I continued going room to room. Distantly, I pondered the wisdom of having hotel rooms joined to one another, but was grateful for the questionable architectural choices. Eventually, it came to a point that I could go no further. I considered my options carefully and determined the only reasonable course of action was to jump from the window. Good timing on the music. <clears throat> With freedom at Finn, I made my way down the street, ducking from one building to the next. 
I chanced to look back at the hotel from which I came, and there I saw a multitude of shapes emerging from the lobby door. They had the all-too-familiar shambling gait of the locals, and among them I spied the pastor, still wearing his crown and robes. I wouldn't call myself a genius, but even I can connect the dots. Their things were now, what you might call, very bad. I continued to flee from the mob with no real destination in mind and soon found myself close to the shores of Devil Reef. Predictably, the reef was full of fish people advancing towards the shore. In retrospect, I don't know why I expected anything different. It became clear by now that the fish people were surrounding me to cut off my escape. They didn't know where I was in town, so they were trying to keep me from leaving. Frantically, I ducked into the shelter of an abandoned building to consult the grocery lad's map and, ah, yes, a plan. I could follow the abandoned rail line out to the t of the town to freedom. Surely the fish people would not be aware of such an obvious exit out of their own territory, which they were vastly more familiar with than I. <laughs> Sensing I was out of time, I stealthily made my way to the decrepit, abandoned rail and began to follow the line. Every minute that passed, I felt more and more like I was soon to be discovered. And, because horror movies had not yet been invented for me to learn from, like a fool, I stopped and turned to look back. Unsurprisingly, there was a horde of fish people in hot pursuit. Can't a young gentle shark catch a break? Apparently not, for the mere sight of such staggering numbers left me faint, and I dropped like a rock, a rock unconscious. Pa. I woke to the gentle patter of rain and clouded sunshine on my face. Apparently I was alive, or something like it. The rain had washed away the footprints and odor of the fish folk, leaving me wondering if they'd ever been real. Like any good gentle shark, I picked myself up, walked to the next village, and found myself a cup of coffee, and got on with my day like nothing happened at all, as you do. I first reported my misery to the police, then took myself to the lo local historical society to get the research about my mother's side of the family, which had been the whole purpose of the trip all along. <clears throat> I met with a curator of the society, a gentle shark by the name of Peabody, who dropped quite a whopper on me. Apparently, my maternal grandmother, rest her soul, was the daughter of one Lady Marsh, of the very same Marsh family from Innsmouth. Seems I had a bit of fish folk in me after all. Who could have foreseen this turning of tables? I made haste to my mother's ancestral family home, where I met with my uncle and burdened him with my fears. My uncle said that he, too, had come to the same conclusions after his own youthful jaunt across the countryside, so he took me to the family vault. There, he showed me family photos, relics, and the bits and baubles secreted away through the years. And there, amongst them, a picture of my grandmother and her progeny, as fishy as any of the folk I saw in Innsmouth. <laughs> and what else could I espy amongst the family relics? Why, a crown, and one of similar constitution as the one I saw on the pastor's head. Truly, the family vault was a veritable trove of plot-concluding exposition. Needless to say, once more, I fainted right then and there and conked myself out. For two years, I kept myself busy with the tedious work of an office job, but... <laughs> but... <clears throat> In the winter of 1930-31, to 31, however, the dreams began. They were very sparse and insidious at first, but increased in frequency and vividness as the weeks went by. Great watery spaces opened out before me, and I seemed to wander through titanic sunken porticos and labyrinths of weedy cyclopean halls with grotesque fishes as my companions. But during the dreams, they did not horrify me at all. I was one with them, wearing their unhuman tra trappings, treading their aqueous ways, and praying monstrously at their evil-bottomed temples. My health and appearance grew steadily worse, till finally I was forced to give up my position and adopt the static, secluded life of an invalid. Some odd nervous affliction had me in its grip. It was then that I began to study the mirror with mounting alarm. The slow ravages of the disease are not pleasant to watch, but in my case, there was something subtler and more puzzling in the background. My father seemed to notice it too, for he began to look at me curiously and almost affrightedly. What was taking place in me? One night, I had a frightful dream in which I met my grandmother under the sea. She lived in a phosphorescent palace Sorry, phosphorescent palace of many terraces, with the 
gardens of strange leprous corals and grotesque brachiate efflorescences. God, Lovecraft loved his alliteration. <laughs> and welcomed me with the warmth that may have been sardonic. She had changed, as those who had taken to water change, and she told me she had never died. Instead, she had gone to spot her, spot her dead son had learned about, and had leapt to the realm of those wonders. This could be my realm, too, for I could not escape it. I would never die, but would live with those who had lived since before man ever walked the earth. So far, I have not shot myself as my Uncle Douglas did. I bought an automatic and almost took the step, but certain dreams deterred me. The tense extremes of horrors are lessening, and I feel strangely drawn toward the unknown sea depths instead of fearing them. I hear and do strange things in my sleep, and awake with a kind of exaltation instead of terror. I do not believe I need to wait for the full change as most have waited. If I did, my father would probably shut me up in a sanitarium, as my poor little cousin is shut up. Stupendous and unheard of of splendors await me below, and I shall seek them soon. <clears throat> Eriale, Cthulhu Fakalan, Ia Ya. No, I shall not shoot myself. I cannot be made to shoot myself. I shall plan my cousin's escape from that Canton madhouse, and together we shall go to Marvel Shadowed Innsmouth. We shall swim out to the brooding reef in the sea and dive down through black abysses. And in that lair of the deep ones, we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever.